Welcome to Hockey Night in New York, where Islanders hockey always reigns supreme. Whether you were raised at the barn in Uniondale or born in the stable at Belmont, Hockey Night in New York is your home for all things Isles. Now, let's drop the puck and get this party started. Ladies and gentlemen, it is Hockey Night in New York. Welcome to the program, everyone. It is Saturday, February 3rd, 2024, coming at you live from Florida Media in Rockfield Center. Great show coming up for you tonight. Arthur Staple of The Athletic will be joining us with me, as always, is Mr. Stefan Rosner. And my name is Sean Cuthbert. Stefan Rosner, how are you? I'm so calm and relaxed. We didn't rush or do anything. We were ready to go. No, no, we were ready to go. We just decided to relax and delay it for a little bit. But, folks, thank you so much for tuning in live here at twitch.tv slash hockey9ny. And all your favorite, uh, you know, sources, right? Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, all that good stuff. Thanks for tuning in. Before we dive in, I want to tell you all about our wonderful sponsors, starting with Blue Line Deli and Bagels. Satisfy your hunger at 719 West Jericho Turnpike in Huntington and 217 Carlton Avenue in East Islip. Check out the menu at bluelinedeli.com. Also proud to be sponsored by Main Street Board Game Cafe. Find your crowd and unplug your game at 307 Main Street in Huntington Village. Also happy to be sponsored by Razor and Kniff, attorneys at law ready to fight for you. Check them out at razorandkniff.com, R-A-I-S-E-R-A-N-D-K-E-N-N-I-F-F.com for a free consultation and also proud to be sponsored by a1 vip entertainment your one-stop entertainment concierge for sports concerts broadway and more one call does it all at 516-787-0048 and of course folks remember if you got questions for us later on the show for questions brewing just type in questions brewing and your question and we'll try to get to it later during the questions segment so with that we got arthur coming on early so we're gonna go straight to break bring arthur staple in hang with us for a minute we'll be right back thank you so much for tuning in to hockey night new york be right back here, it's over. I can't believe they fell short again. Yeah, but they played so well. They made it to the semifinals two years in a row. The semifinals aren't the cup. God damn it, I hate those lightning. They'll get another shot at it next year. I don't even want to talk about it anymore, all right? They lost, okay? Let me just sit here and enjoy the one thing that makes me a little bit happy. This fresh, delicious, tasty, meaty, turkey-filled blue line combo. I eat three every day to help keep me strong. Hey, Donnie, can I have one of those? Coming right up. Talk about a blast from the Blue Line. Blue Line Deli and Bagels. Our goal is to make you a... Attention all artists, storytellers, and creators of all kinds. It's time to make your content stand out above the rest. And Floored Media is the place to make your visions become a reality. Maybe you want to elevate your podcast and add some video. Or turn that novel you wrote into an audiobook. Or maybe you just need the right space to produce your daily vlog. Whether you're a seasoned veteran or just starting out, Floored Media has the professional facilities, exceptional staff, and intimate atmosphere to breathe life into your creative passions at every step of the process. Thanks for giving some time to our sponsors. Ready to talk more aisles? The train rolls on right here on Hockey Night in New York. That's right, folks. It's time for On the Line here at Hockey Night in New York. Joining us from The Athletic, Mr. Arthur Staple. Arthur, welcome back to the show. Let's get right into it. Patrick Waugh, new head coach of the New York Islanders. What is your reaction? <laughs> um, you know, it's <clears throat> everything that Lou Lamarillo does. It's always got a little element of surprise because nobody ever knows anything ahead of time. So I kind of, I think we all had a feeling after the loss in Chicago that Lane Lambert's time was done, but you could just kind of throw a dart at a dartboard with a bunch of names on it. Uh, the coaching candidates that were out there. I don't know that anybody would have hit Patrick Waugh. Not a huge, not much of a connection between the two of them. Mm -hmm. Not a guy that was kind of heavily on a lot of radars. You know, he interviewed in Columbus. I covered the Rangers coaching search. There was a lot of people pushing for him to get an interview there. It didn't happen. Um, but, you know, Lou, is, uh, he operates in his own way. And uh, I think he saw Rua, you know, eager to get back in and seeing what he did in the, in the Quebec League with his team in, in Quebec City and um, saw a guy who was eager for a second chance and saw a team that needed a change. So, uh, you know. Not, a, not necessarily a guy uh, you would have thought to go to Long Island in the past, certainly in previous ownership, previous administration, but but Lou Lamoureux, like I said, operates to his own, you know, marches to his own drummer, and, and here we are, and uh, 
I think a lot of jaws dropped around, especially in, up in Canada. You know, you've seen yeah. a lot of the coverage now. They, this is when they remember the Islanders exist. So uh, it was interesting <laughs> right. to see all the all the coverage up there and acknowledging that uh, kind of like the Bo Bo Red trade this time last year. This is a big deal, and this is a team that's not afraid to to take these big swings. Yeah, absolutely. And look, obviously, this is a transition that's on the fly for Patrick Waugh. He's gotten four games under his belt so far, obviously, with some mixed results. Maybe you can just start talking about, you know, what you saw in those four games and maybe what it could mean for this team going forward, coming out of the break here. You know, just a little bit more competitiveness. Uh, it's one of those things we always kind of joke about. You think back to the Jack Capuano days and how, you know, he just wanted, you know, the, the battle level, that kind of the, his rallying cry and, you know, it's it's a it's a real coaching mantra in the NHL. You have to be able to to compete. The the margin of talent even between teams at the top of the the talent range. You know, the Colorados, the Vancouver's, and maybe teams that aren't quite as high on the talent scale as the, like the Islanders. The, the the difference is so slim between those teams, and you can see it with the parity around the league for the last few years. Um, that if you can just compete hard enough you can be in a lot of games and the Islanders seem to, whether it was blowing the leads, um, getting blown out in some games, not being competitive at all in some games, power, you know, a penalty kill. It just, it just always seems to be mostly about effort and consistency. Um, a lot of areas where they could be working harder and, and whatever, you know, you, it doesn't necessarily fall at the feet of a guy like Lane Lambert. These are professionals. Sometimes there's just, they just get in a funk and nobody can bring them out of it. Uh, and certainly a coach who's not known for motivating um, is has an even harder challenge, I think, to get professional athletes out of that situation. Um, you look at some of the guys who are kind of the best talkers in the league, whether it's a Peter LaViolette, John Tortorella. Sometimes those guys don't excel at the, the X's and O's part of it. I, it's really a, kind of an either or. So I think uh, – the, the way that Lane Lambert and his coaching staff kind of got into that situation early this season, it's just hard to steer that ship around in the middle of the year when you're not a guy who can peel the paint off the walls or, or be inspirational. Um, Patrick Waugh kind of has that, you know, he has that aura. You just, you know, Stefan can attest you're in the room talking to guys who idolize this guy growing up or certainly watched him play growing up and know his reputation as a player. Sometimes that, that can backfire a little bit. I think we've seen, some Hall of Fame players who haven't succeeded behind the bench because they don't know how to communicate with today's player. They just sort of expect, um, well, you know, I did it. I was great. Why can't you guys be great? So, <laughs> right. um, you know, that could, that trap can be fallen into also. But I think um, it's been a long enough time since Patrick Roy's career ended. And I think him coaching teenagers and high-level teenagers in the Quebec League helps him relate to some of these younger guys understand where they're coming from how different it is than when he played um totally different era even i think than when he coached in colorado you know talking to a couple of the guys who played for him for the abs those three years he was there you know i think there was a little bit of uh you know hubris a little bit of arrogance to his his coaching style kind of you know what we see with with great players like that that just the expectation of everyone's going to work as hard and and live up to their their potential like he did and I think he's learned a lot. So I think, you know, it's a very different situation with this Islanders team. They're expected to win now. It's going to be a hard transition. But uh, but I kind of feel like, you know, if you're going to make that move in the middle of the year and still feel like you can salvage the season, this is probably a pretty good guy to go to. Hey, Arthur, and thanks for joining us. You talked about the Bo Horvat <clears throat> trade as, as Lewis, someone that could shock things. I think with Wab being here, do you think there's more maybe focus on Lou to upgrade the team much earlier than the deadline, given that whatever player comes in enough time to – gel and get used to the system rather than waiting maybe till March 8th? You know, I think given the inflexibility of this roster, you know, and we saw today with Julian Gauthier clearing waivers and, and you know, some of the cap-friendly Puckpedia sites announcing the things that the Islanders don't announce to Ryan Pollock coming out of LTIR, which is, you know, a huge boost to, you know, what the Islanders could do to have a kind of the full complement of their D or at least closer to it, even with Adam Pellick. We don't know what his status is. Um, you know, I, I just think that they're, they're so hamstrung by the deals that Lou has signed. Um, I don't know that they can make that big swing right now. So I think this was the big swing with a team that if they had held half of their leads in some of those games, they'd be 
pretty safely in a playoff spot. So I think that was the view that he took. Um, I don't know that they're in a situation right now, sitting four points back of the Flyers, um, though, you know, with a game at hand and, and whatever, 33 games to go. I don't know that they're, they're in that situation where a big trade is going to, is going to be the thing that kind of push them over the top. They still have Ilya Sorokin. They have some injuries that have really hamstrung them. You know, if, if Pollock can be back uh, this week, if Casey Zizekas can be back soon, uh, we don't know about Adam Pellick's status, but if it's not too dire with, uh, with the concussion that he likely suffered on the, the ridiculous hit by Brennan Gallagher, <clears throat> we haven't really seen this team at full strength in a long time. So maybe that's what Lou Lamoureux is pointing to before he gets into the let's start shopping around and see what kind of big swings we can take. There's still five weeks until the trade deadline. Um, a lot of games between now and then, so we'll see what they can come up with and see if this becomes a team that, you know, with a week of Patrick Waugh kind of brainstorming to see what he can come up with with what he's got. Yeah, for sure. And speaking of Patrick Waugh, one addition the Islanders were able to make, they bring in Waugh's assistant coach here, Benoit De, De Rose. I hope I'm presen- pronouncing <laughs> his name yeah. right. But do you happen to have a, uh, a scouting report on him and what he might bring to the team? No idea. I <laughs> uh, love the honesty. Junior hockey is not my not my area of expertise that I follow, but um, but he's obviously worked with Patrick Waugh, I think, for his whole stint, his whole like most recent stint in Quebec. So uh, he's obviously a guy that Roy trusts. You know, you you come to a team, inherit assistant coaches who are used to doing things a certain way. Um, I think it's good for continuity. It's good to kind of learn the lingo if you're Patrick Waugh, but also you probably want a guy in there that you know can convey your message and uh, is an up and comer. So, um, you know, I think you're, you're essentially retooling the coaching staff on the fly. We'll see what happens at the end of the season, depending on how successful they are uh, the rest of this season with, with John McClain and Doug Huda. But, um, but I think this move is just, you know, Patrick Waugh gets another guy in the coaching room who he knows well and, and can communicate his message. Arthur, with Barzal, I know you spoke to him, and I did as well. It's just when you talk to a guy like that who's clearly already bought in, I guess, and how excited he is to have Y here, just how important is it for the team when the top guys are buying in that quickly to something? I mean, it, <clears throat> the talk is nice, but you got to be able to do it on, you know, out on the ice, obviously. And, you know, I've seen it before. Uh, Barzal was a rookie with Doug Waite as the coach. You know, I don't, I don't think Doug Waite's a bad coach, but I think you look at another guy who's not in the Hall of Fame, maybe deserves to be. But I think his frustration came on quickly with that group. There's obviously a lot of other things going on. John Tavares' last season or, you know, heading into his decision of free agency. Um, it, it, so there were, you know, Barzal being in there as a rookie, a team that wanted to be high tempo on offense and completely disappeared defensively. And a lot of the same guys, uh, minus Tavares, who ended up being incredibly good defensively as a team the next few years under Barry Trotz. Um, so, you know, you, you talk a good game and you get excited about someone in there who, who you idolize or, you know, well, and, um, you can talk about high level hockey, but, but this is still, you know, the Islanders failings are not at the offensive end this season. I, I don't think that you necessarily need a more motivated Matthew Barzal, more creative Matthew Barzal. You need a guy who can play the way that Patrick Roy wants the team to play and convey the message to the rest of the room that this is the way we have to play to win. You know, I, I don't think Matthew Barzell has been in that, that role before in his career. Um, you know, I think he had certain assignments under Barry Trotz and under Lane Lambert, mostly under Barry Trotz. And I think it was a learning process. And I think we saw a lot of Matthew Barzell not being put in certain situations, late in games, close games, defensive zone draws, things like that. Um, where it's hearing from Patrick Waugh, he wants to see Matthew Barzal become that kind of player where, you know, I think you're seeing that same transition right now uh, with Connor McDavid under Chris Knobloch, where the guy who's unquestionably the most talented player in the league and MVP could be MVP year after year after year, but is not a complete enough player to make that elevate that entire team. He certainly elevates the game when he's on the ice, but he's got to be, you've got to be more than just that in today's NHL. So I think that's what Patrick Roy wants for Matthew Barzell. Um, and if Matthew Barzell wants it, great. Then Patrick Roy is the right guy. If you're just talking about 
how cool it is to have Patrick Waugh here. And I'm not saying that Barzell has done that. It was, you know, he certainly seemed enthused about, you know, Barzell's a hockey nut. Patrick Waugh is a hockey nut. You get those two guys like that together who have incredible skill and, and history. Uh, it's got to be a fun conversation. But uh, but the, the things that are that are failing this team this year, I don't think have a lot to do with encouraging Matthew Barzell to be more creative. It's encouraging him to spread the message that, blowing leads and failing to play defense is completely unacceptable and giving up 35 shots a game is an embarrassment. So we'll see if, <laughs> if Matthew Barzal can be part of that conversation, part of that turnaround. And if he can, then yeah, I think, uh, you know, I, I think adding that dimension to his game and his role on this team is, uh, would be huge. All great points, Arthur. And you, you mentioned the the team not really being healthy throughout the season. Have there been any updates on some of those names out there, like Pula, Casey Zizekas? You, you touched on Pelic a little bit, but is, is there any update on who might be coming back, or is there any th- t- type of uh, timetable update here? I mean, we just look for hints, right? Uh, like we said, you know, they took Ryan Pollock off LTIR today. Mm-hmm. Um, he, that's a huge sign for them. Uh, you know, I think. Uh, I, I hadn't gotten out to too many games, but seeing Pollock in a walking boot, whatever it was, a month or six weeks ago, was a bad sign. Saw him at you know after uh, one of their more recent games before the break, uh, walking around outside the locker room, no boot, always a good sign. Um, so I, you know, if he's if he's back in uh, Monday night in Toronto, then obviously that's a huge boost. But like we said, Adam Pollock, we have no idea about listing him as day to day. Uh, sounds encouraging, but I think with with a head injury like that, and we you know we certainly know how many games you know whatever it was twenty one games he missed last year after right. a, a big hit from Robert Bortuzzo. So um, he certainly had incredibly bad luck with with injuries and things that cost him a long long stretch. Same as this year. Um, so we'll see on that front. And uh, Sadikus, you know, I think he'll be back uh, in the next week week or two I heard he was skating as well during the break so um that would be encouraging to to see but um but yeah our, our injury updates Patrick Ross seems to be a little bit looser than his predecessor in talking about uh, injury status but maybe part of this week was the education the Lou Lamarillo education for for Patrick Waugh where he learns not to share too much so we'll see how it goes Arthur, you wrote a great piece on Igor Shosturkin, and I know his numbers are a little worse than Ilya's, but both of them have struggled to not be to be at their best this year. I guess, what is the biggest thing that you really saw in Shosturkin's game so far this year? Because it probably has some relation to what uh, Ilya has been going through. It's a little different to me because Shosturkin, I think, is facing fewer shots this year. I think the Rangers' team defense has actually been better, and that you know I think has sort of magnified some of his issues. Whether it's you know, I think. Being, you know, being beat over his glove side, uh, he's already given up more goals this year, high glove, than he gave up all of last season. Um, and his, you know, cl- tight game uh, goals, you know, expected save, he'd expected goals expected saved above expectation have been really down uh, in when the game's tied or when they're leading or trailing by one. And, and I think, kind of anecdotally, Ranger fans would tell you when they're down. Uh, they've given up goals within a minute, especially with him and net, uh, I think eight or nine times this year. So, um, you know, I think there's a little bit of mental focus for him, mental sharpness. I, I feel like Sorokin has the opposite problem where his, he's just getting worn down. Uh, the amount of chances and shots that the Islanders give up in every game is just astonishing. You know, you, you see their, their numbers down there with San Jose and Chicago, who are two teams that are fighting it out for the first overall or at least the most ping pong balls to try to get the first overall pick that you'd almost say you've got two teams that are you don't you don't want to throw the t word tanking in there but they're sort of you know they are what they are and they, they're pretty thin all the way around and they're going to give up a lot because they just don't have a lot of talent on the ice and the and then there's the islanders who are a team that can score goals and can take leads and they're just getting shelled game in and game out and uh it's mind-boggling and i i can't imagine that Sorokin can kind of maintain that, you know, he, he says he's fine. He likes facing a lot of shots and that's facing a lot of shots is one thing when it's stuff from the outside and it's not that harmful. Um, but, but, you know, they give up the, I think they're 29th or 30th and high danger chances per game. I think it's something like 17 a game. It's just an astronomical number for any goalie. Um, so I, you know, I feel like, he and Shesterkin have had similar numbers, but to to arrive at those numbers very differently. Uh, and for Sorokin, I, I can't 
imagine that you can, you know, you give up one bad goal and it seems deflating because those, you know, the numbers really tell you, I think if you give up a low danger goal uh, from Steve Aliquette's clear sight uh, data, I think you lose 85% of the time. And I think with the Islanders, they could overcome it because there's just such a volume of shots and chances that he's bound to give up a bad goal here and there because, you know, how can you maintain your your mental and physical sharpness with all that kind of work? Get, you know, you getting into your setup, getting up, getting down, even if the puck doesn't reach you, there's, there's still, uh, you have to be ready at every, it seems like for the full 60 minutes, there's no breaks with them. So that's, that's something that they really, really need to fix if they want to him, him to play at a, an extreme, you know, the high level that he can play at, he's still in the top 10 in terms of goals saved above expectation. And it, you, you hardly notice it because they just face so many chances and shots. And yeah. to, pi- to piggyback off that, sorry, just I guess how important now with Varlama back, I know we started the last two before the break, but how important isn't that Varlamov is healthy? And do you think with Wa, knowing Varlamov's game and knowing really a goaltender's mindset that not that it's going to be a 50-50 split, but that Varlamov's going to play a lot more in this second half than he did last year? I mean, it's, you know, it's, you have to have two goalies and, and the way the schedule is and the way that you, it's hard to lean on guys. And, and I imagine that much like last year, um, we're going to see Sorokin play some back to backs just because they're in, they're in a desperate situation at every, you know, as, as Patrick Ross said in his introductory press conference, this is the playoffs and it's going to last a long time for the Islanders. So I think they're going to lean on Sorokin and they're going to lean on Barlamov because those that's one of their biggest strengths. And um, so it's good to have, at least have the option there of having Barlamov. Obviously when he was out, it was really the Sorokin show and you, you weren't, you know, they, they weren't really comfortable putting Ken Appleby in there. So um, it's important, but I think the most important thing is they got to fix their team defense and fix their, you know, their play in their own zone, whether it's five on five or on the penalty kill and, and kind of take, some of the heat off their goalies to allow them to be uh, a big asset for the team. No doubt, Arthur. And the last one I'll leave you with you now, obviously completely different circumstances, but you see what Knobloch did up there in Edmonton. Uh, can Patrick Waugh help turn things around here with the Islanders on the outside looking in? Can he help them get into the playoffs before the season is through? Boy, it'd be nice to have Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl <laughs> yeah, to help yeah, you do that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, I'm Chris Knobloch's a good coach and, and, you know, I don't, he got a couple of shots at the Rangers job and didn't get it. So, I, you know, I think that the writing was kind of on the wall for him and the Rangers organization. So it was, you know, kind of a, a surprising move to, to take a, an AHL coach from another organization in the middle of the year, but his connection to McDavid and clearly, you know, McDavid, like we were talking about, not just raising his game when he's on the ice, but just raising his all around presence and, and effort and, and bringing the whole team along and, and the few tweaks that, that Chris Knobloch made, they're getting some saves too, which obviously helps. Uh, so yeah, that, that turnaround was, you sort of felt it coming because they were too good to be down where they were. Um, the Islanders, I, I don't know. I don't know what kind of team they are. If, uh, if they can ever be at full health, especially on defense, right. um, you know, the fact that, they were able to go whatever it was, 12, 4, and 4 when Pellick and then Pollock were out for long stretches at that 20 game run it was pretty impressive that they were able to to win those games. I mean, they were they were not it was not a sustainable way to win those games or get those points, but they were doing it. And then everything started to kind of fall, you know, grind to a halt around the time of that seven nothing beating by the Penguins uh, at home right before New Year's, uh, and a miserable January and obviously the changes that they made. But mm. um you know, I don't, I don't know, uh, really. Yeah, you know, I think I wrote that a few weeks ago. Like, who is, what are the Islanders? Do they have an identity? For for mm-hmm. the last five years, we knew exactly what kind of team they would be. I think teams around the league knew exactly who they'd be facing when they played the Islanders, a team that was going to grind you down, uh, not going to score a lot, not going to give you a lot. That was going to give you a lot of low quality around the around the the perimeter of the zone, but you have to fight for space uh, in between the hash marks in front of the net. And that's not been their identity this year. I don't know if they can get it back. I don't know if Patrick Waugh has enough in his, in his bag of tricks, whether it's mm. uh, confidence boosting uh, system design. I don't know if you can turn that sort of thing around because it's been 50 games of not showing that identity. So um, we may have to forget about 
the Islanders having that identity for the foreseeable future and just just kind of the desperate race to get one or two points every night to stay stay in the hunt or try to leapfrog it, it it's also maddening to see how bad the division has been you know the rangers mm-hmm. kind of ran off at the beginning and they've been a 500 team for two and a half months now uh right. carolina's stops and starts bad goaltending uh philly got off to an un- a surprising start and they seem to be heading south pretty fast the devils can't get it together the penguins can't get it together man the, the opportunity that the <laughs> islanders have missed by blowing right. some of those points uh right. in the first 49 games is got to be keeping people up at night um so if they can focus on you know getting whatever 50 points out of these last 33 games for somewhere between 45 and, and 50 probably gets them in uh you know maybe 45 even the way that everybody's playing 45 can get you in if you get to whatever you know 96 or 97 um but it's going to be tight and if mm-hmm. they miss by a point or two there's going to be a, a a dozen different games you can point to and say that was that was one that was one that was one and and wonder if this team can ever get that identity back um you know i'm interested to see what patrick waugh thinks and whether he thinks that this group as constituted can play that way or play a consistent enough style but uh but yeah when when people ask you ask i kind of just shrug my shoulders and say they got to do it on the ice they haven't you know it's only been a couple weeks of Patrick Waugh and I think this break is probably good for everybody to try to get a little healthier and for him to you know gather his wits about him after a really whirlwind couple of weeks but um, but I'm interested to see you know starting off in Toronto and then uh, you know Tampa I think those are two pretty good tests to to kind of start things off and see if they're going to make any adjustments or changes um you know, I think just to be able to keep a team under 30 shots tonight, you know, for a week or two would be a, an incredible achievement and see if that can that kind of kick some kickstart them some, some things. And, um, you know, if it continues to kind of bob along below the, the playoff cut line and you see the Twitter arguments, whether they should sell or whatever, <laughs> it's kind of like I, they can't sell anything. No. I, I don't I don't know what anybody would be buying from them other than. Uh, you know, if you traded a guy like Brock Nelson, which would be a hugely demoralizing blow to the to the, the group, to the organization, right. to trade a guy who's a top ten, probably when it's all said and done, a top five player in the history of your organization, um, basically to throw on the towel on the season, I can't see that happening. So, uh, I think this is the group. Maybe you can add a little bit around the edges, uh, another forward maybe to be, you know, someone with a little bit more consistency might be good. But um, but I think the the room as is uh, needs to kind of, you know, take charge of, of who they are and who they've been in the past and, and see where they can go with it. And Patrick Waugh comes up with a couple of, you know, a couple of little tweaks. I don't think they'll be the Oilers, but maybe they can get in and do some damage. <laughs> Probably not the Oilers, but we will wait and see what happens. Arthur... Always a pleasure to have you on the show. Always appreciate your time. Thank you so much, and I uh, love the Expos hat. <laughs> Thanks a lot. You got it, boys. You got it. Take Thanks, care. Thanks, Arthur. All right, folks, despite what your screen might have showed you, that was not Peter Bois of The Athletic. That was Arthur Staple. So thanks so much to him for tuning in. Great stuff, as always. Stefan, before we get into the next segment, we're going to take a little break here. So, folks, I want to tell you all about Main Street Board Game Cafe in Huntington Village on Long Island's North Shore. Games for sale and for open play, food and drink, beer and wine, fun, and friends. Bring the magic of phones down, eyes up, tabletop board games to your family. Our staff will help you find the right game. From old favorites to the hottest new releases, we have everything from strategic to easy party games. Get off your screens for a night your family will remember. Looking for meetups to join? Our Magic the Gathering, Dungeons and Dragons, Lorcana, and organized play communities are welcoming for all. We also do parties and corporate events. Located at 307 Main Street in Huntington Village. Go to mainstboardgamecafe.com for more information. Main Street Board Game Cafe. Find your crowd. Unplug your game. So folks, want to thank you all once again for tuning in here at Hockey Night in New York. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back.
Hey there, welcome back. We missed you too. Now kick up your feet and settle back in to Hockey Night in New York. Welcome back to the program, ladies and gentlemen. You are watching and or listening to Hockey Night in New York. Great segment from Arthur Staple. Always. So, Stefan, you had some heavy coverage on All-Star Weekend. The skills competition, the games the games itself, not just the game, right? They still call it the All-Star Game, even skills though there count. are multiple games today, Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, you had a running blog going. Why don't you tell us about what you saw, particularly, you know, with Matt Barzell, how he represented the New York Islanders in All-Star Weekend. Well, I would say that when we get into, up, you know, this week coming up with Tampa, if, if Kucherov plays the way like, that game, the way he did in this <laughs> skills competition, Dude, the Islanders going to have a good time. Talk about mailing it in. I just hope he was hammered. Or on shrooms like Bublé. <laughs> well, Butchikov but, said, he said, I think he got into Tom Wilson's cooler, which good, is a great Good, good. I mean, whatever. Let's move on to Barzal. Cause sure. He had himself a great, first off, this is a guy that was not even supposed to be in the skills competition. And I think right, that it was very good for right. hockey that he was because he's very talented, loses by 0.1 second to McDavid. Yeah. And the fast skater, he came around the edge and kind of lost it. People complained that McDavid hit one of the cones and should have been disqualified. Barzal put on a good show there. He did really well in all, really all the competitions. And I thought he was going to finish in second place in this whole thing, except the obstacle course, the passing to the middle, min, uh, the mini nets really cost him yeah. there. He was on a great... And then, again, what, you saw once he was missing really wide that it was just at that point... Yeah, so many people there, so much pressure. But all in all, he had a great skills competition, really got close to winning it. But at the end of the day, David designed it. He wanted to add some new things. He absolutely yeah, killed it. Yeah, how convenient. It. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah, he could, honestly, they could have blindfolded him and he was winning that event. I mean, he's. it just shows, again, these are the elite of the elite. And he made things look so, so easy. And then you get to the All-Star game. Three assists in game one. Okay. Then he's got a goal and two assists in the finals. Gets the... Uh, made it... Five, five, three on Matthew's assist late. He, he did very well for himself. He yeah. doesn't win MVP, but six points. And what he showed in the skills competition. And he's got Patrick Waugh. And he represented the Islanders pretty well. I mean, you talk. we talked a lot about the options should be there. Things like that. But I think you look at Barzal's personality and all the media. Not yeah. saying Dobson's not that guy, but Dobson's a very quiet guy. He doesn't. Right. I don't think he loves right. the spotlight. Barzal being there and talking on NHL Network, Eats to ESPN, up. to everything. Mm-hmm. And the way he talked about the Islanders and under what, how they were playing about all the, like, I think it was just really the smart idea to pick him. One, he's the face of the franchise, but again, just the way, again, you look at all these players in this thing, like Nathan McKinnon doesn't talk a lot. A lot of these guys don't talk right. much. barzal has got that personality that the league gets to show off. Yes. So the fact that he wasn't even going to begin this skills to begin with, they'll look back and go, okay, anytime we have a chance to put Barzal in any league event, we're going to do it. Yeah, I think he did extremely well for himself, not only on the ice, but off the ice. A great showcase for Barzal as a star in this league and for the Islanders. You yeah. know, just, just a nice publicity for them. And I think, like you said, he represented them well, and, and I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up in a few more of these. Yeah, they should. You want to come back? It doesn't matter what he <laughs> right. does. Right, for sure. Maybe Kucherov stays home next time. Maybe uh, Stan well, Coast or Braden, po- Braden Point ends up in there next time. That's the year. other thing is like everyone, there's people that are on both sides saying, yeah. well, who cares? It's, it's funny, but there's probably other guys that maybe would never get the chance to do that in their career, be a part of it. That if you didn't really want to play in it, I mean, there were guys there, all the all stars were there. They just not all of them in the skills. There could have been someone else that come in and played that, and maybe their kids are there, and they have one of those good moments. I think, again, it doesn't mean anything, and Kucherov mailed it in, whether he was drunk or whatever, but there's probably <laughs> someone else that would have gone out there, not really tried super hard, but hey, get that opportunity that maybe he'll never get again. Yeah, it just seems like he didn't want to be there. No, exactly. Yeah, yeah it's not a good just, look. Yeah, for sure. So maybe, maybe he misses it next year. He deserves to be there for what he did during the season, but you know, oh, yeah. you kind of you got to play the game. You got to play the role, right? Then again, if he had said no, he gets suspended a game. Right. So, so maybe that's the problem. Don't right. suspend the guy. Pick people that want to well, be there. Well, I'm pretty sure. Like, look, you talk about Noah Dobson not going there. I'm sure the, the teams themselves have a little bit of a hand yeah. on who gets picked to go. So this is something they could have been like, hey, hey Kucherov, you want to go? Ah, I'm good. All right, we'll send Stammer. We'll send Braden yeah. or whatever. But I'm sure it's a lesson learned. But again, uh, he, he played the well in the, the league. In the All-Star game, he played well. Right. So right. it was just the skills. Put someone okay. else in it. But maybe it he doesn't like the spotlight. I don't know. No, he just like so. So to wrap up the All Star game, I mean, what what did you think of the formatting? They brought the draft back, the skills they changed up. Obviously, with McDavid heavily involved, and uh, the game really didn't. The games didn't really change that much themselves. The three on three and everything. But what'd you think? I'm not an alcoholic, but again, they should all been hammered for the draft. Like we saw, like feel like you like the boost. Five six years ago, (laughs) five or six years. I love that voice. Five or six years ago, I mean, they were hammered. And it was hysterical. And I think this year, as they tried to make it funny and had the mics on, 
The problem was that players already had the jerseys with their name on it, so you kind of knew that it was already fixed on who was getting drafted. Yeah. So I think, again, alcohol or just hang with Buble a lot more would have made it more interesting. Buble was the star of the show. He carried it. His back's got to be Bubbles killing him. Mikey Bubbles was outstanding. That, that press conference was just amazing. And just the day and age that we're in now where that flies. And like he didn't, he didn't, uh, like yeah. 10, 15, 20 years ago, if that happened, like the gasps and like, you know, maybe just cutting to commercial with him saying that, you know, this year they're just like, oh, yeah, there's, there's Bubbles. He's high. He's having a good time. It's uh, amazing. And Will Arnett next and was the funnier part because there was like no, re like, oh yeah, you know, he's just on microdose of shrooms. <laughs> well, he did a great job of kind of just being like, because you almost see it in the press. He was like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh my God. You know what I mean? And he kind of tried to steer away from it a little bit, but he, he did a good job and with it too. Arnett, I forgot who he was talking to, but he mentioned yeah. that, and he mentioned the mushrooms and he asked the person, he goes, oh, is that out there? And she, I think it was um, Emily Kaplan. And she's like, yeah, it is. He goes, oh, okay. So we could talk about it. I, I cannot believe we're talking about a, uh, a superstar mu uh, musician uh, doing shrooms uh, at a, a professional sporting event, but here we are. And it's not Bieber. It's, it's <laughs> even though, right? oh, <laughs> even though go, ahead, go for it. I'm going to plug it because I thought it. it was brilliant. But uh, so, <laughs> Bieber dressed up as legitimate mushroom. It looked like it. And I was like, oh, little, you know, Bublé might try to take to, a bite to him. bubbles over yeah, there. Yeah, I mean, anyway, let's move on to like, you know, the things that do matter. Yeah, yeah, like jerseys, right? Yeah, jerseys. Like right, the one you're wearing. Yeah, exactly. Like the, the jerseys this year weren't great for the All-Star game again. Doesn't matter. But this this is what a jersey looks like right here. I love these jerseys from last year, that whole thing. Uh, but I wanted to give a little shout out to my buddy Oscar here. Oscar's Pro Stitch hockey hockey uh, stitch over there uh, does a great job basically you get a blank jersey and that could be current that could be new it could be old like you can get a retro jersey he'll do all the stitching for you for the numbers the names on the back he does an outstanding job so definitely check him out at oscar psh that's at oscar pro stitch hockey outstanding job and uh thanks for the great work there Our oscar so let's move on to the islanders now stefan yeah, uh, on a day where, you know, Lou loves to fly under the radar with these things. And just Obviously. Again, he doesn't announce anything today. Um, we heard it through Elliot Friedman yesterday that Julian Gody is placed in waivers. Kind of sent a shock just because why? Um, the Islanders, again, had a, a roster spot with McLean being down in Bridgeport. If they needed to activate any, somebody, they had the roster spot. They could have moved someone to LTIR. Like, it mm -hmm. was possible without waving Godier. I know on Twitter that I put out A, B, C, or D, and then I went into five reasons why it could have been waived. Now, Gody is fast. Um, and I yes. do think his IQ is underrated. Doesn't mm -hmm. mean his IQ is good enough for what Wah wants. So I thought maybe, okay, maybe is it that he just can't play the way Wah wants to play? Are they sending him down maybe as a paper move? He is a, he was a scratch in Bridgeport tonight, but I believe that he is down there. I don't think they could paper or wave somebody. They could paper a transaction mm -hmm. somebody. So that moves on to the next point. So Godet clears waivers. Simon Holmstrom is sent down. He is waiver exempt. Uh, mm -hmm. He is not playing tonight. Okay. Again, that's just a paper transaction. Okay. Kyle McLean, who was sent down, did not play tonight either, so it sounds like he's coming back up. Okay. Which might hint give us a hint that Zekas isn't quite ready yet. And also, Ryan Pulak, again, not officially announced by the team, has been activated out of LTIR. Mm. Have some numbers written down because I am not a captologist and I cannot stand numbers. But right now they have about $224,000 in cap space with those moves that are made. Now, again, McLean's not back up yet. Holmstrom's a tr paper transaction. So if they want to activate... Pulak, you got to think someone else has to go on LTIR. But right now, for one day, one day, the Islanders are accruing cap space. Now, okay. people could say, well, that means nothing. Every penny in the salary cap era sure. matters. Um, so that's the moves today. Godier clears waivers. Holmstrom was sent down. Pulak off LTIR. The Islanders, I believe, are going to practice uh, tomorrow. Okay. So they aren't allowed to practice anything till the afternoon, but they practice tomorrow. Mm. They play Monday. So we'll obviously be able to update on everything who's out there that wasn't out there, who's back up, who's not, all that stuff. But yeah, Lou during the Barzal being in the semifinals and finals of the All Star game did some. So again, everyone says Lou's sleeping. He doesn't sleep. He's been doing all this <laughs> stuff all day. But again, like Arthur said, he doesn't panic. He doesn't sleep. Pulak being back is so big. Again, Adam Pellick right now is not on. LTR or IR. Mm -hmm. He's day to day. Now, could that change? A thousand percent. But getting Pulak back is vital because we talked about goaltending with Arthur. We talked about the offense. Mm -hmm. If they don't fix their defense, they're going nowhere. They're going absolutely nowhere. Is, and, yeah, and you can say that for most teams. But again, for a team where their offense is good enough that if they just allow one or two fewer games or even one fewer goal a game, they're winning all these. Again, they lost by a goal in every game under Wa. So right. I think it's huge for Pulak to be back. Now, I don't know if he practices tomorrow that will play Monday, but the fact that he's off LTIR when they usually wait to activate guys like the night of the game. So if they're at a morning skate and Pulak skates, but he's still on LTIR, they won't activate him until warm-ups or two hours after practice. So the mm -hmm. fact that he was already activated, right. again, team didn't announce it, but cap-friendly and puck Peter aren't making this up. 
Right. Neither is the NHL media site. Sure. So that tells me that he could be back Monday. And like you said, it would be huge. I think, though, we got a taste of, of whether it was the, the personnel or yeah. the, you know, the system. Just because when you had these guys healthy, you still had the issues yeah. and you still had the problems. So, yes, great that Pollock's coming back. But I think we kind of have to shine a spotlight on how Patrick Waugh has them playing in the defensive zone. Because even with those guys healthy, it wasn't working. So, you know, hopefully that's something that we see kicking into gear sooner than later. Because as we know outside looking in all, already a handful of points outside of a playoff spot so they need to kick that into gear uh, very quickly but yes obviously a huge help pull it coming in with with pellet going out it's funny how it just seems to be these guys swapping and out you just can't get everybody healthy at the same time but but good stuff there so we covered a lot of bases with arthur we covered you know we talked about the injuries a little more in depth uh, we talked about the assistant coaching hiring so unless you have anything to add there i think we could just move on well about these we're just gonna call him B D. How about that? B D. B D. Sure, we'll play it safe. Okay, cool. Um so the one thing I heard about Benoit. him is that he's a defensive juggernaut right. mindset. Mm -hmm. Um they won the Memorial Cup last year with the Quebec Ramparts and that he was really instrumental in not just having a defensive structure, but he, they helped coach the most disciplined team in that league. And in juniors. Like and you look that. at the Islanders, sure. Discipline has been an issue. And again, just discipline's not just penalties. Discipline is just making the right plays out there and not making the wrong plays sure. and things like that. You look at, again, talk about the Flyers before they fall from grace now after everything that's going to happen with that organization. Mm. Um, they're the, one of the more disciplined teams in the league just in terms of decision-making, which is why they're winning games despite maybe a lack of elite, elite talent. So if the honors could get this guy here, he's also 35, first chance at the NHL level to coach. Um, that's it's young. huge. <laughs> and again, I think it also puts a little bit of weight, uh, pressure, excuse me, on... On Doug Huda, because again, under Trost, there was sure. three head coach, uh, three assistant coaches. Mm -hmm. When Lane got hired, they only kept two. So you could have three on there. It doesn't mean him uh, BD coming in. It means Huda's gone. That being said, right. BD's a defensive minded coach, and he's going to probably help with the PK and all those things like that. You don't need two voices doing that when one wasn't working, right? Right. So I think it's a trial for both assistant coaches and McLean and Huda, but I think for Huda especially, it's this guy could take his job. Again, they could keep three next year, but. Who just yeah, I don't. Yeah. I don't think anything changes until the season's exactly. over. Exactly. No, I agree. Right. Yeah. All right. So with that, let's move on to what's on tap. It's time for what's on tap. Brought to you by A One VIP Entertainment. That's right, folks. It's time for what's on tap. So let's dive into it. As Arthur alluded to during his interview, Monday, the Islanders go into Toronto to start phase two of Patrick Waugh being behind the bench here for the New York Islanders. So, Stefan, let's talk about the tough test up there. Always a tough place to go into playing in Toronto. Uh, what are we looking at here? Uh, well, the Islanders have beat them twice this year in overtime. They have, I think yeah. that's a positive. You're going sure. into Toronto. Um, obviously, Barzal feels good in Toronto. He had a good weekend. He does. Matthews did win MVP, but... You know, yeah. things like that. Politics. I think it's funny. That, I think it's funny that Barzal played with Matthews, Marner, and Riley, and Tavares wasn't there. I that think that's a that is a nice little nugget. There. It's, it's just, yeah, it's just, that is pretty funny. It's just funny, you know. Um, as <laughs> for I laugh, no particular as I clearly reason. laugh here. Um, but I think for the Islanders again, like Arthur said, this is a huge test. And again, you can't look too much ahead. You got to focus game by game. But if the Islanders come out of the break. Again, they played. Barzal thinks the last five or six games, especially the last four, was the best hockey he's played in his entire career. He said that at the All Star lot, game yeah. yesterday, mm -hmm. and I think that's huge. One again, for him to say that that he actually feels that way in terms of back checking. He brought that up and loving back checking. That's something he told me before that he's just loving areas of his game that he never really, not that he didn't pay too much attention to, but like you know, no one loves back checking. I don't in, in, in <laughs> right. No one loves doing that. But when you get your star player who's offensive based off the rush speed. Loving back check and making those plays and helping in that area. That's huge. But if the Islanders, again, come out of the break, beat a Toronto Maple Leafs team to kickstart their second half here where they're going to have to go on a run, like Wah said. Yeah. So vital because Wah's talked so much about the mental side, and that's the next mm -hmm. step for this team is just breaking those mental barriers, getting the mental side strong. Nothing is better than coming out of the break against a really good team, beating them, and then moving on to an even better, not maybe an even better team, but just an elite team as well, and then trying to build momentum there. Yeah, I'll tell you. I mean, this start to the Patrick Wah era has not been easy. You look at the teams, you know, before the break here. Yeah. Now what you have, and we'll move on to the next one here. Thursday, Tampa comes to town, 8 p.m. start. I'm guessing that must be a national broadcast game. I believe it's ESPN. There you go. So ESPN, maybe a little more John Bucci-Gross for that one. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, you're moving on from Tampa. Uh, sorry, from Toronto to Tampa. You get uh, a motivated Kucherov, most likely. <laughs> <laughs> Stamkos, Braden Point, Victor Hedman, all the stars up there, uh, down there. Uh, what do you see out of that one? I think it's going to be a really physical game. Um, obviously, these teams have played each other before in the semifinals. There's a lot of hate 
Kucherov especially slashing mm. Pajon and then empty netter. If you guys remember a couple yeah, of years ago, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think I, I think it's going to be a tough game. I think if the Islanders can play the way they've played in a lot of these games this past week, where again suffocating them in the neutral zone, getting it on the forecheck against these really talented teams, the last thing you could do is allow them to break out quick. And then that's what, again, you saw against Vegas, a very good Vegas team. Mm-hmm. The Islanders made it really impossible for them to get up the ice. And that, that helped with guys going up the rink on Vegas having to dump and change because they're exhausted. And against the Lightning, who doesn't really matter every year when they make changes, they're just such a deep team. And I think having guys like Kucherov or Stamkos or Sorelli or guys like that point, spending as much time in their D zone as possible, because again, it doesn't mean have to be ridiculous forechecking. You just got to be in the right spots, and that's the structure that Waz preaching. So I think I think all these games, especially against Toronto and Tampa, are going to be very close, and it's going to come down to the honors capitalizing their one or two chances that they've really this whole week. They scored, but they've had a lot more chances to maybe put some games out of reach before having to come back, or you know they trailed in every game except one, and they entered the right. third period lo- trailing in all games. The only time they had the lead was actually two minutes into Waz first game with Dallas where Romanov uh, scored on the rush. Right. And that was it. They had a lead since then. So I think obviously, of course, we talk about it a lot. Getting the lead obviously as early as possible, but they play the way they played against Vegas to start all these games against these elite teams. They're going to have a much higher chance of winning these ones. Well, that's the thing here, right? We've seen throughout this entire season, whether it's been under Lane or been under Patrick Waugh, that they've been able to hang with all the top teams in the league, usually hanging in by a goal or two. That goal or two might end up being an empty net or something yeah. like that. But, I mean, they've gone the distance with the majority of these teams and, and beaten some of them. It's just a matter of closing out strong. And if you don't start strong, close out strong. Like, come back, you know. And and, and I still want to see, we talked about this last week, I still want to see this Islander team with a lead under Patrick yeah. Wall because we haven't seen that yet. Let's see if there's a change, especially, I'd love to see them going into a lead in the third period this week just to see how the team performs, how they handle that situation. Are they going to go for the kill or are we going to see them dropping back on D? Now, we're, we're hearing that that probably won't be the case, but I want to see it put it in practice here and see if we can see an Islander team that is going into a lead against a Toronto team or a Tampa team and going for that two-goal lead instead of yep. just, you know, praying and hoping you can hang on to the one goal lead you know so we'll see so last one for this week and you had a point there I was gonna say I wrote a story about that at the hockey news um, oh, last too. week and mm-hmm. we talked to Wah and he was asked about it and he said to you uh, it was funny Wah is very good going back and forth with the media and he asked Ethan Sears who we've had on the show numerous times he goes I think Ethan asked about leads and how he wants to go about it and he said well, when you have a lead in football what do the teams do Ethan's like run the ball and he's like exactly so how do you run the ball in hockey? And Ethan said, possess. And he's like, yes, we possess the puck. We keep the puck. Again, dumping and changing is great, but you're giving the puck right back to the opponent. He wants them to keep doing what they're doing with the lead. Stay aggressive. Go for the kill. I think he mentioned that once, per a quote, go for the kill. Right. Don't allow the team to get back in there. And he thinks, again, running the ball, holding on to the puck, making plays. That's how you're going to close it out. So I think we're not going to see the shell. We're going to see a very aggressive team with the lead trying to add. And again, Easier said than done in the regular season when it comes to the playoffs, but the Islanders have to play the game. And right now, they're regular season games. So I think trying to score as many goals as possible rather than sit back. This team blown too many leads by sitting back. And I think Wah understands that. And with the talent they have, again, they have enough offensive talent they to score. They can do it, yeah. It's just about keeping the puck out of your nut. And I think with Wah, he's preached a lot about offensive zone time, defensive zone time. His whole goal about winning is obviously offense is the best defense. And I think that's what we're going to see with the lead, but they have to show it. No question about it. And last one on the docket here is Saturday, 1 p.m. start. The Calgary Flames come to town. And uh, due to the football festivities going on that weekend, we will be moving our show, a little post-game edition of Hockey Night New York later on that night. That Saturday, we will not uh, trouble you with a Hockey Night New York episode on Super Bowl Sunday. So tune in on Saturday night once again for Hockey Night New York. So what do you see out of Islanders Flames? Well, the last time they played the Flames, we all remember that snapped a seven-game losing skid, courtesy of Oliver Walsh, who I believe was a negative three through regulation Mm -hmm. scores, and we all thought that was it for Lane. If they lose that game, that was it. That was the weekend. And um, whether you believe Walsh actually saved them with the shootout winner or not, we'll we'll never know. Um, But it's a huge game. Again, the Flames just sold Lindholm. They're clearly, you know, I do think they're eventually going to sell Hannafin. At some point, Tanev is also going to be on the move, whether it happens before the Islanders play him or after. There's a clear issue with that team. Markstrom, I think, he could really be on the move. That team like the Devils seems like a no-brainer. I know Markstrom's not an elite superstar goalie, but no offense to the Devils goalies. Anything's better what they're running out right now. It's just reality of the situation. And mm-hmm. they really need... If they're going to turn their season around with Jack Hughes saying he's really close to being back, they're going to need... Even if Hughes is back, they're going to need some type of goaltending. And it's, not again, not a knock on those guys. They're all NHL-caliber guys. But getting a guy like Markstrom... 
who again with that team could really help. I think you're going to see this Flames team really sell off as many pieces as possible. And that again, a team like that, one, that could be a positive for a team, saying guys that stay there that, hey, we had to trade our top guys because we didn't play well enough. Mm. That either ignites them or makes them feel like a team that has nothing to play for. Both are very dangerous. We've seen that before, like the Blackhawks. Nothing to play for, yet they beat the Islanders. So Calgary really depends, I guess, on their mindset, what happens this week if any trains are ma- uh, trades are made more outside of the Lindholm deal. But regardless, the Islanders got to beat this team. This is a bad team. That's, well, excuse me, not a bad team, but it's a team that's clearly yeah, not giving up looks, on the year. But mm, there's a again, you got Kuzmenko once you, once back. Once you start but, trading big players away, yeah. it's kind of a, it's it's pretty much a sign that you're you're kind of not mailing it in, but you, you understand that you may not be making it. You know what I mean? You're taking the foot off the gas. But that doesn't mean the Islanders should exactly. And that's, they and they can't against anybody. Exactly. They don't have any more mulligans. They don't have any opportunities to take their foot off the gas. So they're they're going to have to come out against Calgary in a, in a Saturday afternoon game. Everybody loves the Islanders afternoon games, and uh, you know beat a team that they're better. They should be better than. And especially after unloading a guy like Lindholm. So hopefully the Islanders can come out, give a strong game, and uh, take two points against Calgary. And before we move on from what's on tap, do you know what else is on tap, Stefan Rosner? I'm going to, because I'm going to tell you. The Hero of the Week? No, no, <laughs> man. A1 VIP oh, Entertainment yeah. Featured Events. Yes, of course. Come on, How buddy. Did I forget. All right, let's go to MSG Friday, February 9th. Billy Joel, Friday, March 22nd. Fallout Boy at MSG. And then over at UBS Arena, Wednesday, February 14th, Valentine's Day, date night. Stevie Nicks, great one there. Fleetwood Mac, you a Fleetwood Mac fan, buddy? Yeah. Sure. All right, <laughs> moving on. Saturday, March 30th and Sunday, March 34th, 34th, 31st, Zach Bryan at UBS Arena as well. And A1 VIP Entertainment is also offering listeners and viewers of Hockey Night New York an Islanders playoff push package by four games. Get one free for home games at UBS Arena. Call 516-787-0048. Mention Hockey Night New York for 10% off those featured events. One call does it all so Stefan Rosner why don't we move on to hero of the week ladies and gentlemen when you hear this song that means it is time for the hero of the week brought to you by the blue line deli and bagels half price hero which this week is the hockey night in New York featuring grilled chicken buffalo sauce avocado and mozzarella cheese in a wrap With that out of the way Stefan Rosner who's your hero of the week it's Matthew Barzal this is a guy that um, clearly had a week he was the only all-star uh. for the Islanders but, uh, again, six points, that's huge. It's absolutely huge, again, for what he showed, not just the points, we talked about it, what he did off the rink as well with the media. Huge for the Islanders. You had a lot of, uh, whether it's ESPN, ABC, Kevin Bieksa, all those things, talking about the Islanders. And, again, Wah brought that maybe more to light that, oh, the Islanders, they're relevant. But I think what Barzal did this week in talking to as many people, getting the conversation about the Islanders going, that's huge for this organization. Yeah, no doubt. We talked about it early, and, and, and Matt Barzell just did a tremendous job uh, representing this team and 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 I think officially now he's the fifth player in the league right because he finished fifth in the skills competition that's pretty much fifth ta- most talented player yeah 100 percent yeah, yeah. Uh, I think we close yeah, yeah there's book no on dispute that there one, right? uh, why don't we move on to the snake then with Jake the snake Jake how are we doing buddy I'm doing great you know yeah yeah okay so what do you got for us tonight a little Jake's take so because we saw some trades happen this week I thought I would um, give the viewers Three targets that I think would fit the island. Hey, I like that. Let's yeah. hear it. But uh, first, I will say that those trades were pretty expensive, so <laughs> I don't know what You don't know the take. logistics. Okay. Yes. And Fair we, enough. We do know that Lou does like to trade his picks, so we'll see. We'll but, see. Uh, yeah. So first off, and we've heard this name around, uh, Jacob Chikrin, two-way defenseman. He's 25 That's going to cost old. a lot. He's got two years under team control. He's got 28 points in 47 games. 203 points in 432 games in his career. So it's a solid blue liner right there. He can move the puck. I think it would help them a lot. Um, the next two guys are actually former Rangers, so Rangers fans aren't going to like this. But first up, Frank Vitrano, who's having a career year. Yeah, He has 22 time. goals this year. His career high is 24, and he's already got yeah, 22 goals that. in 50 games, <laughs> which wow. matches his last year as well. So I think that's, that's a great guy he can bring. Uh, top six scoring to the team. Don't know what the roster would look like. The lines change in there. Sure, sure. But and he on, he's only um, at an AAV of three point six five million dollars with two years under team control. Okay. So okay, that's a workable the, with number. The cap, I, you know, I'm like Steph, and I'm not very good with numbers there. <laughs> but that, okay. that's a guy who could bring some explosiveness to the team. Sure. And then this one 
is Anthony Duclair is my third one. Okay. And he's only making $3 million a year, but he is a UFA at the end of the year. He's got 17 points in 46 games. But something interesting is his career plus minus is plus 35. Look at that. So that could fit a defensive system or okay. you know, just help out. A good bottom six guy there. I've always been a uh, fan of him. He, he was great last year on the Panthers run to the Stanley Cup. So, yeah. So, Jacob Chikorin, Frank Vetrano, Anthony Duclair. Don't know how it plays out with Cap, but I think those are three names that I would definitely be happy with as an Islanders fan if they went and got them. So, Jake, not from State Farm, Radonis is leaning on, on forwards here as opposed to defensive. Well, they said Chikorin. Chikorin, yeah. Uh, well, see, my memory is, is lapsing. Well, can you, can you see, so, so once he got to the second and third guy, I already forgot about the first guy. I can, think that Chikorin <laughs> would be the home run here. Uh, yeah. But he's going to be the most expensive. Well, well, that's what I was going to pitch to you, Stefan. You, you hear these names. Uh, are any of these guys, uh, I guess, gettable for Lou Lamarillo when you consider the cap and you consider what the Islanders may or may not be able to offer? Yeah, first off, can you tell Jake to take off that Red Sox hat? I can't talk to him if he's going to keep that on. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, I don't even know. No, no can do. Okay. Wow, anyway. wow. Well, we got the Expos and the Red I Sox I quit. Tonight. No. Um, <laughs> Chikorin, uh, first off, all these trades are doable when lose your GM. It's just fans aren't going to like that. Whatever deal that Lou's probably going to make, whether it's a bona fide defenseman or a top six forward, the first round pick is going bye-bye. It's just... Uh, Scott Lawton, yeah. the center on the Flyers, they're asking for a first. Again, it's different with mm -hmm. the center. It's a slim market. That's why people talk about Brock Nelson that, wow, you know, if, if they could get a first-round pick for Lawton, what can they get for Nelson? I agree with Arthur. That's an, unless the Islanders are so far out of it and Nelson said, I am not re-signing with you guys after mm -hmm. next year he has one more year left, mm -hmm. then you move him. But there is no way, again, not a betting man or an alcoholic, but if I was a betting <laughs> so man you say. or an alcoholic... Uh, well, alcohol has nothing to do with this. Betting man, I, I don't think there's any way Brock Nelson leaves the organization unless he wants to leave. And again, I don't see that happening. No. Anthony Duclair is someone I thought for sure. Again, with the Islanders' third line winger, if unless Oliver Wallstrom is really going to get a shot here, mm -hmm. under one is going to figure out, and he shows why that he could play in a system. The third line winger, right wing or left, because Holmstrom's a natural right side, mm -hmm. he wants to play his off wing. Duclair's speed. You just lost Godia on waivers again. You could obviously call mm -hmm. him back up, but mm -hmm. I still think the Islanders need speed. I think Duclair would be cheap, like Jake said. Um, I think Chikorin definitely is doable. Again, first round pick, you'd have to have him to an extension. Lou doesn't do rentals. Um, right. And he was, oh, right. Vetrano. The one thing I'll say about Vetrano is that, again, he's got term. I think he has a year left, right? Yeah. A year left. But again, you're going to have to give a first round pick probably for him. Some team is going to overpay, and it's a career year. Now you look at what they did with Bo Horvat. For sure, they were getting Horvat though more for not just his goals, production, but hey, he could fit with Barzal long term, um, a top player. For Toronto on one one year, giving up a first for a player that maybe doesn't ever come close to doing what he's doing this year on a bad duck team. Same thing with Henrique. Thought that was a name out there to be a bottom six center if the Islanders weren't getting Sezikis back. But again, he's going to be a free agent. You're not probably re signing him. Uh, for a guy like Henrique, again, getting points in Anaheim, what does that tell you? It's like Duclair if he had 30 goals this year for San Jose. Is he really. Again, that's a San Jose team, like a Doug Wade team, where it's, well, it is a Doug Wade team, actually. Isn't he assisting? <laughs> well, it's just run and gun. Islander fans know all about that, too, when you have yeah. in lost seasons, like a guy like Marius Tchaikovsky putting up like 30, 35 goals in a, in a season, in a lost season, right? So uh, we're familiar with that. But look, I, I think any of those names would be a great pickup. It's a matter of, you know, what kind of magic Lou can weave to, to bring cap. those guys in. Well, Obviously. that's, I, I mean, that's all and part of it, right? LTIR, all that like stuff. What, yeah, exactly. Like, th that's a lot of hoops you got to jump through to to not only be cap compliant, but but also, you know, give up whatever assets you have in an already very depleted system, obviously, right? Like, there's there's not much in the cupboard, you know, down low, uh, you know, in the bridge and whatnot. And, and you know, even like with draft capital, is this another first round pick that, that Lou is going to give up? What, what I would say is that I think people overrate the picks mm -hmm. because, one, you trade Horvat, you get Horvat for eight years. Yeah, you, you give the that's, first. Romanov, and that's why Lou does it. No, yeah. Romanov, again, if it's a top five pick that you're trading away potentially, mm -hmm. then yeah, but the Islanders, even if they barely make the playoffs, it's, the likelihood of them landing in the top right. five is small, so essentially becomes a late first, early second, the way you want to look at it. Yeah, but, and you can always tie lottery protection into those deals too. And so. again, it's, it's the long-term commitment to these guys. If they trade the first and a prospect and maybe a second for Jacob Chikrin, but he signs a seven-year extension. I mean, that's the important thing is, is you're giving up these picks for guys that are going to be here to be part of Wa's future or this team's future. You're not doing it for a rental. And again, if Wa doesn't like the guy, you're not bringing him in. So I think I think Lou is going to be really strategic because again, this getting guys this deadline, whether the Islanders are in it or not, 
does matter because it'll at least allow if the Islanders aren't going to make the playoffs, whatever player comes in, it gives them 30 plus games to learn why the system rather than if you make a trade in the offseason at the draft where they got to come into camp fresh, doesn't know, don't know the system, haven't been practicing with the team. And then maybe it's a slower start for that guy when the season starts. You get a guy now. Same way we look at Horvat last year. And again, it's different now with Wah, but if this was reverse and Wah was here last year, at least Horvat comes in, Barzal still gets hurt. Horvat has 30 games to learn Wah's system. When you start this year, Horvat already knows. So I think there's mm-hmm. value, and that's why I asked Arthur, is there value in going and being proactive before March 8th to bring someone in here now? Sure. Because yeah, of course. at that point, the Islanders could be 15 points out of a playoff spot where now you could save the season if you make a move now. But like Arthur said, I think, I think Lou wants to see what this team looks like healthy. I think if if no one was coming back, you got to focus on defense. you got to fill that side, whether it's a right side or left mm-hmm. side, depending mm-hmm. on Pelik or Pulak. But I just think if Lou's going to be... If Lou thinks they could really make the playoffs and, and could get a piece, whether it's a defenseman or a, a depth forward, even a top six forward, I don't think he's going to wait till March 8th. That being said, the other team has to be willing to say, offers too good, why would we wait? And and if he does wait until March 8th, he's only doing it because they're still in it. Exactly. Because he's, he's obviously not bringing anybody on if it's not going to make a difference, right? So yeah, maybe sooner the better, but I have a feeling we'll be talking more about this in Questions Brewing. And before we get into Questions Brewing, I want to tell y'all about Isles Fix. Islanders Country, get your daily fix of Isles news, highlights, and analysis by subscribing to Isles Fix, the only Monday through Friday Islanders newsletter sent directly to your inbox. Sign up for free or become a paid subscriber for added benefits at islesfix.substack.com. So now this is the part of the show where I ask Ed Burns and Jay Belsky how they're doing behind the desk. Uh, we're doing great. We're, uh, <laughs> we're hearing some weird vibration. Well, it's really just Jay. We don't know where it's coming from, but uh, it's not my phone. Okay. He keeps asking, is it your phone? I, say, I keep saying no. It's not oh. my phone. Well, I just learned okay. something. I, His last name is Burns? Yeah. Yeah. No, no idea. Yeah, like yeah. the actor. Yeah. yeah. Or like Mr. Burns. Or Miss Montgomery Burns, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, Jay, this it's is your studio, so I'm sure it's you know maybe you have something in a in a in a in a cupboard somewhere. I don't My know. Phone That's is your right business. Right here, and it's been vibrating the whole show. Yeah, that I've been you hearing do? all night. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Guys. Huh. You might have to put Do Not Disturb on next time. Well, if things break. Because it was very disturbing. Yeah, well. So, fellas, we're doing all right over there. (laughs) Yeah. The mystery has been solved, apparently. That's great. So why don't we get into questions brewing? (laughs) Why don't we? (laughs) It's time for questions brewing. So go ahead. Ask us a question. That guy's voice, man. All right, folks. Thanks for hanging out with us live here tonight. Hope we got some questions going. But, Ed, you can tell us if we do. What do we got going on in the chat, buddy? (laughs) We do. We have more than just chat. We have uh, some stuff from uh, Twitter, From Twitterverse? From Twitterverse. Let's go. From Twitterverse. Some preemptive questions that uh, you so kindly sent me. That's right. This one is from Michael on Twitter. (laughs) Question for the show tonight. If there were Olympic Games for uh, for this year... I, I count three guarantees for the Islanders to make the rosters. Barzi, Sorokin, and Nelson. Horvat falling short, as well as Dobson, since he's still so young. You think Romanov gets on Team Russia? What about any Swedish guys? Engvall, Holmstrom, Aho? Wow, let's just send them all. Um, well, I would say skip <laughs> the Russia for now, because I don't know what's going to happen. Fair point. I don't know what is going to happen. Fair point. It doesn't even, our opinions there don't even matter on that. There may not be a Russian participation. I, again, That's correct. no idea. What I will sure. say is that I do think the next year they're going to have the Olympics in Milano. I think it's in Italy, right? In Italy. I don't know if it's Milano. Whatever. I don't, know Italy, my, I don't know yeah. my cities in Italy. Two um, years, yeah. But yeah. why not Dobson? Uh, he's going to probably be a top three, top four Norris finish. Well, I, he's talking about if it was this year, this uh, summer. Yeah. yeah, if it was this. But I still think he would make if it, it this year. This yeah. upcoming summer, yeah, I don't yeah, think yeah. he's your number one pairing, but he's on, sure. I think he makes that roster. I don't yeah, think. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think, I agree. I, did he say Brock Nelson for yeah, US? Yeah, I don't, I don't or, know if Nelson makes it. That I, would, I he'd be that, on the fringe. Fringe start, again, he's also underrated. We know he's one of the most underrated players yeah. in the league. Yeah. I, definitely Anders Lee wouldn't make the team. No, um, no. In terms of Sweden, I don't think Sweden's a powerhouse. Sweden's I don't think Engvall or Aho like to make it. Uh, or, or uh, yeah, Aho. I don't think so. Um, Holmstrom, no, no. So I think right now would be if there's a team Russia. Again, you probably should Sturkin, Sorokin, Vasilevsky, your goalies. Mm-hmm. Romanov, right. maybe again. They also sometimes pull from the leagues over there too. 
not only it depends on like see like I think a good example with with Romanov is also Brock Nelson. Like it depends on what kind of roles they want to fill, yep. right? Like if they're just going point production superstars, then Romanov isn't isn't going to be a guy, right? But if they're looking for somebody who can play more stalwart stalwart defense, then he's a guy that might end up end up making it, right? And then you have Brock Nelson. He plays a nice two way game and he can score goals. So maybe he is a guy that gets a bottom six role on a team USA. You know what I mean? The only problem with Brock Nelson is the the clock is sort of ticking on his age. So you know maybe if they want some some younger guys in there for a little more foot speed but I think you know those are maybe fringe selections but either way I, I like the question I love that we're just talking about international hockey again I love that the what do you, what do they call it the uh, the four, the four, four nations four nation uh, tournament, tournament, tournament or yeah. something like that. Definitely four nations. Yes. Is in the name. Yes. yes. And then you have uh the guarantee now that they'll be in the next two winter Olympics which is no awesome. All-Star game next year. On account of on account of the Olympics, which is fine by me. I love the the best on best. I love the international stuff. So you know this this should also be kind of a, a segue into the World Cup of Hockey coming back too. Uh, so I'm loving that as well. So I, I love just the fact that we're talking about international com- competition. Good question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, next one from Brian G on Twitter. Besides Arthur Kaliev or Anthony Duclair. Uh, who are some other? Do you like the way I pronounce that? Yes, you know this. A little southern twang. Uh, are, are are some who are some other winger candidates for the Isles? Well, Jake brought up one, right? Yeah. Frank Petrano. Yeah, Frank Petrano. I think that's an option there. Uh, Stefan, anybody else in mind? Well, I think Henrik plays wing as well. You could do that. He's played a lot of wing. He plays mm-hmm. center as well. I just again, I get the question. I don't think that's the priority, nor should it be. I think the I think the forwards, the offense has been good enough, and I know maybe under Watt they didn't score enough goals, but. If they got to add, I don't. Again, I think they really was going to try Oliver Wallstrom here. Looks and that again, way. And again, the yeah. way Walk coaches, the top six are playing every other shift in the third period. Mm-hmm. Why is Lane? Uh, excuse me, not Lane. Sorry. Why is Lou going to go and spend picks, assets, which they don't have much of, to get a depth winger when they do have Godier to come in with speed? They do have fashing. They do have those guys. Where again, sure, if they want to be the deepest team possible, yeah. But at the same time, again, we just talked about it. The defense is the most important thing. Right. Um, and who knows? Maybe a guy like Engvall is playing on your third line after. The, I think after this break, and they'll see a practice tomorrow. The lines outside of Horvin and Barzal could be completely different. Yeah, I think which changes a- everything about. Maybe you don't have to go get a third line winger because you have Engvall down there. You have Lee down there. We have no idea. So it could be the Islanders need to go get a top guy, which changes the entire conversation. I mean, so far Wa has gone with what's worked under Lane Lambert. Obviously, that's uh, you know give or take depending on the night. But uh, maybe with this break, he's had an opportunity to look at the roster a little bit more and say, okay, I'm going to try this guy here, that guy there. So it'll be interesting to see if if he plays it safe with what he had already or if he jumbles the lines a little like, bit. So. I really don't wouldn't be shocked if Lee wasn't on the top line anymore and it was a guy like Paul Mary mm. or Oliver Wallstrom gets a chance in the top six where he's if he's going to be an NHL player, it's going to be a top six role. Or do we see a call-up from Bridgeport? Like, really, Wa, Anything can happen. Wa had a week to dissect film yeah. and dissect mm-hmm. who's not working with my system, who is. Right. And again, Godi, as much as it could have been just a roster move to clear a spot, mm-hmm. I think Godi's lack of, not again, lack of discipline in terms of decision making and, mm-hmm. and maybe the turnovers mm-hmm. is something that Wa said, listen, I, I, there, there comes a time. I can't work a, with this. There's, but there's some time <laughs> in, a, in a player's career where that's just their game. Yeah. And for Godi, he's not old. I think he's 26. But look at a guy like Wallstrom, who's 23. Like he's much more teachable at this point to groom into playing the way that he has to play for his career. Where maybe a guy like Godier or like Fashion, like that's their game. And if they're not gonna like Godier has speed, he can't really be a you know, IQ wise. Of course, is not something you can really teach at this point in a career. You either have it or you don't. Right. Like maybe, and it's not a knock on Godier, but maybe Wash said, "Listen, like I need him to play a certain way, and I don't think same way we could see with Engvall. Even though we got a seven year deal, that you know, like Engvall's got speed, he's great in transition, but." He doesn't play this way, and I need guys playing this way. So I think this was a huge week for Wada, really dissect. Because I, again, I wouldn't be shocked by any changes coming tomorrow at practice. We're gonna find out, Ed. What do you got? Next up from Andremi thirteen. What are your thoughts on the Islanders getting Bowen Byram? A lot of talk he's available, and that he's very unhappy with his ice time. I saw you shaking your head, Stefan. I just again, what is it gonna cost? Bo Barham's a very young guy. Whether you think he's worth a first-round pick or not, he, again, the first-round pick is going, and now Lou's got to think, okay, mm. got to get a bona fide. Bo Barham hasn't had a lot of playing time. He's a very good defenseman. He might make a Team Canada roster as a depth guy. But mm. the way the Islanders don't need any more question marks. If they're trading the first-round pick and stuff for a, a shutdown demon or an extra demon, they gotta, like, Lou's got to know that that guy is going to be a stable guy that you could trust every day, every, right. every moment. 
and again, I, I think I like Bo Byram's game a lot. He's had injury history. He had mm. a major concussion last year. Like, I don't know at this point in time that it's again getting young defensemen is huge because you'll have you know Dobson eight year contract probably Romanov probably is going to be on his way to a long term deal that you're going to mm. make your D as deep and young as possible. But I think for this time, if the Honors want to go on a run, it's more like a guy like Chris Tanev, a defensive minded D man who blocks shots, gives the body, not not a question mark guy. You know. Sure, Ed. Next up from Mr. Tom Boyle. Do you see Sezikis and Pelic on LTIR? Um, I don't know about Sezikis. I think Sezikis is closer to coming back than people think. Um, I know, Arthur, what he said about that he heard Sezikis was skating. I also mm-hmm. heard that he was skating, that he was out of his boot. I'm not saying he's back tomorrow, so I don't think Sezikis is going on LTIR. That being said, for two days or three days, both, not Pelic, because if Pelic goes on LTIR, he's got to miss 10 games and 28 days. He only right. missed what? And he's what? supposedly day to day. Two games. Right. So if they put him into LTIR and he's back early, again, concussions are so hard with timetables, different for everybody. Mm-hmm. You don't want to get in a situation where he's ready to go and you have to wait. Right. Um, so Zeke is, though, because he's missed what, three, it's like 25 days already and he's missed the games, that if they mm-hmm. put him on LTIR today and retroactive, uh, retroactivated him, they could just activate him tomorrow. And he's already played the amount of games. So mm-hmm. I would say definitely Sezika is over Pelic just for the sense that he's already back. We saw that when um, Pulak moved to LTIR to activate Pelic. Pulak mm-hmm. had already, I think he had one more day left to sit. That's the only reason they did it. They weren't going to do something where they were going to screw themselves. Right. So I think out of those two, Sezika is more likely because he could be activated tomorrow. We'll see. Next up from aisle 72. Mayfield has been awful. Do you think he's just <laughs> going through a rough patch or is he done like dinner? <laughs> I think done. I guess like it depends how long is, you cook your premature. dinner. Right? <laughs> yeah, I think um, that's fair. A rough sneezing. A rough sneezing. Season? God bless you. It, it did sound like that, <laughs> did I say right? That? Yeah, it's been a good night. Uh, <laughs> a rough season. Uh, it has been for for the entire. Well, most of the defensive core. A good portion of the defensive core. Portion like dinner. Correct. Yeah. Nicely done. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, Clever. I mean, Mayfield's had a rough go. We, we've talked about Pellick not really looking himself when he's been healthy in the lineup. Even, look, uh, the struggles even when they were healthy earlier on in the season. Pollock was in the lineup too. And it's just, again, is it a product of, of how Lane had them playing? Or was just these were these guys just struggling individually? And, and I guess we'll get a clearer answer of that once we see how Patrick, 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 what is going on? Patrick Waugh is able to further instill his systems uh, on this team. So, Did you uh, hang with Michael Bubbles for a little bit? I don't know, man. <laughs> like maybe it's the 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 French Canadian that's entering the team here French with Canadian <laughs> with with the Patrick Waugh and his assistant now. But yeah, I mean, I think I think we'll we'll have a better understanding of whether Mayfield himself has been rough. I mean, look, I mean, there's been undisciplined penalties. I mean, the the guy seems to send pucks down the ice for icing more than than I care to like uh, over the course of his career. That's that seems to be something that just happens every now and then. Um, but again, the defense as a as a whole has has struggled a bit here. So um, I'm not sure if if it's if it's just on Mayfield or maybe it's also a product of how um, Lane had them playing. Next up from CGS eight seven eight, is Sorokin going to get much needed uh, rest if Varlamov wins a few games in a row? I think Sorokin's starting right out of the gate. I think mm-hmm. him not playing the last two was to give him a breather, and Wa said it was to give him more time off. But if they're going to win games, again Varlamov could do that. But if they're going to go on an absolute tear, they need elite Sorokin to be elite Sorokin. And I think this break, a mental break, having a physical break with this week off. Sorokin, like Arthur said, he's going to play a lot of these games, but having Varlamov as a, hey, every four or five games or every three games, get Varlamov in there with the back-to-backs definitely helps. But I think if the honor's making the playoffs, as much as the defense being better is going to be the the you know the main thing here, I think Sorokin being that elite guy and stealing them games is equally as important. Agreed. Ed? Uh, next up from Matthew Scarloff on Facebook. So with Gautier and Holmstrom back in Bridgeport, is this Wallstrom's job to lose? Also, do we have an update on Pelic? Not sure if you covered any of this earlier. I was at a dinner at the Embassy Diner. <laughs> <laughs> embassy Diner is a great time. Um, All right. Well, you touched again, on this Holmstrom, before. Hol- I don't know this for a fact, but I would be completely shocked if Holmstrom's not back up tomorrow. Again, he didn't yeah, play in Bridgeport. He's coming back, Paper think. transaction, like I said, yeah. to recruit cap space for one day. Um, but I think the Godier being on waivers should have, Wallstrom's confidence should have skyrocketed just for the fact that. He, he I mean, wasn't the two, one who two traded. weeks ago you had said that Patrick Waugh coming in was already a, an opportunity for yeah. Walsh. And like now it's like, wow, he things are really turning game. up Millhouse for him right now, right? He's got to take advantage of it, though. One game, no shots, won a face off that Pendle got thrown out of. They score on that goal. That was when 
Wallstrom won it. Peugeot whipped. Holmes right, scored. Right, right. He kept looking over his shoulder defensively to make sure he was in the right spots. Not saying it's put him in the Hall of Fame. Mm. But for Wallstrom, if he's going to get minutes in games, and he was benched during that game or mm. taken out of the rotation. Yeah. Um, but the only way Wallstrom is going to play is the same way if, the way he was going to play under Trotz. He's got to be sound defensively. He's not going to be sound defensively. It's not as to the, uh, not his position. That being said, it seems like right now, He's going to get a couple of games here, to, or maybe just a game by game, to prove his worth. And if he keeps building, he's going to stay in the lineup. Yeah, and look, this may be you know his last shot to really seize an opportunity. He's had chances here. before. Yes, yes, and we've seen it not go his way. So he's really got to show something out there, even if he's not sniping goals every other shift. I mean, at least being a little more responsible on the defensive side of things, like you said. I mean, you know, because how many, t- you know, how much are you going to trial and error this guy and, and give him a chance and have it not work out? I mean, he's been in and out of the lineup for a reason, so he's really got to seize this opportunity and, and try to remain in the lineup. And like I said before, I'm not saying that he deserves to be a second line forward, mm-hmm. but if Wa looks and says, listen, the second line's been stale, whether it's Engvall dropping down or maybe Lee and Pajot get reunited. We mm-hmm. saw how they played well enough earlier in the year together, especially in training camp. Mm. I know Lee was struggling at that point, but maybe a top six role with the confidence that Wallstrom has with the ability to shoot, and maybe maybe that gives them the best chance for the honors to maybe make their team a little deeper. They need that third line to be more of a shutdown line. It's right. got to be, especially with the fourth line really not playing much in the third period. Pajot and Holmstrom, they need they need that guy. So, And that's why you might see uh, some lineup changes if Wallstrom's going to get in because – not being known for his two-way game, maybe he ends up on the second line. And maybe a guy like Paul Mary drops down to the third. I yeah. feel like he can play more of a two-way game down Rotations there. Rotations during the game. Yeah, well. we'll see. Ed, what else you got? Uh, we're talking trades tonight, apparently, a mm, lot. Okay. Uh, so I think I'm going to combine what I believe are our last two questions. Okay. Uh, so CGS to X, um, if they lose the next four games in a row, is it time for Lou to make some trades? I guess we're on the hypotheticals. Like We're not sure if this is going to happen. Or not. And aisle 72 asks, if Lou is a buyer at the end of the uh, trade deadline, what's your best get? guess at a target? Not necessarily a winger or yeah. you know, maybe a defenseman. I think the Islanders losing their next four games doesn't matter because they could win their next four games after that. I don't <laughs> think Lou's going to... I think if Lou is going to sell, it's going to happen on March 8th. I don't think he's going to sell prematurely. That makes no sense to do that unless someone comes calling with an offer that is a grand slam offer, but I doubt that. Um, if they're going to buy, I really do think they got to go defense. They could get Chikrin. I think that's your fantasy pickup in terms of mm-hmm. getting him and extending him. Mm-hmm. Then Chris Tanev is maybe more likely just to get another body on the back end, especially mm-hmm. if Portuzo is going to stay out, things like that. And then and for a winger, again, Vertrano, I wouldn't throw a first for him, but if you could give a, a second or two seconds, something like that. But I, I do think the focus has to be on the back end because that's their biggest issue right now. Yeah, I agree with that. And, and like Stefan said, I don't think they become sellers until it's very clear that the playoffs are out of the picture. But and the I don't truth think that will is, happen by March but, Well, I don't know. You bring, well, it depends on how the other teams around them yeah. do, right? I mean, because it's so funny. We look at, you know, what's been happening this year. It's almost like a carbon copy of what happened last year with January, right? Where they have a bad month. They're still in it. They just got to go on a little bit Every of a run here. Dead. And then they're right back in it. So so if, if you have other teams losing while the Islanders are losing, then yeah, then this, the stay of execution gets gets postponed, right? And then Lou doesn't have to pull the trigger on maybe unloading guys. And then, and then the whole question is, if he is going to sell, who's that going to be? But I, I think... You know, that'll get delayed, delayed, delayed. Because, again, we've talked about it on the show. Arthur mentioned it, too. Like, this is a team that is going for it this year. They they have to win. They want to win. So, Lou's not going to sell until it's just absolutely clear that it's kind of a lost cause kind of trying to salvage the season. So, I mean, he's going to probably, you know, wait a little bit to see how things go. Maybe even to buy. I know we talked about buying early is, is, is the better way to go. But, but look, you know... There has to some change has to happen in the wins and loss column very very soon because when you're four or five points out now, another week or so can turn into seven to ten points, and that's when you really start wondering to yourself: is, is it worth it? Uh, you know, going for it here. So, uh, and we actually our last one will be uh, from our very own Florida Media Jay. Oh, hi Jay! You're getting involved here. I love get, that. Have the guys name one Fleetwood Mac song. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna go with Stefan on this one, yeah. Okay, so I know Fleetwood Mac songs. Naming them would I'm really bad with naming songs in general. <laughs> I know like if there was a song that came out, I'd be like, oh, I know this one. Next, give it, give it a shot. No, <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't even make. I I, is there a the in any of their songs? Sure, Pro- okay. probably. Yeah, yeah. Probably. Didn't one of their the, one of the lead singers die recently or like a year ago? 
I think you might be right about that. See, I know some stuff. But but uh, it wasn't Stevie, obviously. She's playing at UBS soon, so she's still yeah. kicking. Did but, you even uh, know she was in Fleetwood Mac? <laughs> I don't want to talk about anything. Just... <laughs> Sean, name one song. Uh, sorry, that's all the time we have <laughs> for Hockey Night in New York, but we'll get to that next week. You know what's so fine? I probably know about five of them, and none, none are coming to me right now. I probably know yeah. two, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> but they're not coming to me. We won't waste any more time on that. But, Jay, Dreams. you know what? It's just great to have you involved in the show. <laughs> I mean, thanks for chiming in Took here. three years. No. Love yeah, that. All right. So why don't oh, we... Oh, Jake knows. I do. What do you got, I Jake? Got We're going to go with Dreams. Dreams! There you go. There I'll you take, go. I'll take your word for go. it. Nice job. Yeah. All, All right, there right we seven. go. Fleetwood Mac, Stevie Nicks, UBS, Valentine's Day. Go on a date. <laughs> It'll be great. All right, Ed, play that music. We're going to get out of here. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you all for tuning in to twitch.tv slash hockey night NY and, and everywhere, everywhere else pretty much now. Uh, thanks so much for hanging with us in the chat. Thanks for your questions on Questions Brewing. And of course, a big thanks to Arthur Staple of The Athletic for a great, great spot. And of course, I want to thank our sponsors, starting with Blue Line Deli and Bagels, located at 719 West Jericho Turnpike in Huntington, 217 Carlson Avenue in East Islip. Check out the menu at bluelinedeli.com. Also, big thanks to Main Street Board Game Cafe, located at 307 Main Street in Huntington Village. Find out how to unplug your game at Main stboardgamecafe.com also want to send out a big thanks to Razor and Kniff Attorneys at Law nobody likes going to court but hey if you have to call 516-742-7600 for a free consultation and last but not least a huge thanks to A1 VIP Entertainment your one stop entertainment concierge for sports concerts Broadway and more one call does it all at 516-787-0048 and with that folks remember rate review subscribe tell everybody how much you love Hockey Night in New York. And Stefan, where can we find you on the internet and social media? You can follow me on Twitter at Stefan underscore Rosner, S-T-E-F-E-N underscore Rosner, the Hockey News Islanders and Rangers, and NHL.com. You can follow myself on Twitter at Shawnee Hockey. You can follow the show at Hockey Night NY on all social media platforms. So for Stefan, for Ed, for Jay, for Jake the Snake, for Donis, we've been Hockey Night in New York. Remember, we'll see you next Saturday. We'll confirm a time, but Saturday night after the Islanders versus the Flames. Have a great rest of your weekend. We'll see you next time.